70 years spearheading the world of international motorsport, Formula One is littered with seminal events, controversy and stories as yet untold. And in those 70 years of competition, the biggest names have carried the most weight. When the Lotus name reappeared on the grid in 2010, it carried the fortunes of the great team Lotus's name on its shoulders and optimistically carried a flat cap to each race to throw up in the air in case of victory in the style of Colin Chapman. But unfortunately, that never came to pass. But just as the Lotus team was admitted at short notice to the 2010 grid as late as September 2009, it cemented the end of another great name's attempt to re-immerse itself in Formula One. Founded in 1958 by Eric Broadley, Lola can trace its history in F1 back to 1962, supplying its Mark IV chassis to Reg Parnell's privateer team, fielding British duo John Surtees and Roy Salvadori as its driving lineup. Having developed a relationship with Surtees in that time, Broadley returned to F1 to pen the works Honda team's RA300 chassis in 1967, beginning a course of sporadic involvement throughout the next few decades. Lola designed cars for Graham Hill's eponymous team in the 70s, and then Carl Haas Beatrice backed F1 projects in the 1980s, before jumping ship to build the LaRousse team's chassis until 1990. An ill-fated year with Giuseppe Lucchini's Scuderia Italia team in 1993 ended with a short hiatus, before Lola attempted to make a go of it once more for the 1998 season. This was before title sponsor Mastercard insisted that the team fast-tracked its project for a 1997 entry, which ended abruptly having been 11 seconds off the pace in the Melbourne season opener's practice sessions. Broadly then sold up to Irish property developer Martin Borain, who focused the Lola Group's efforts into sports cars, the American Kart Series and junior categories over the next decade. Certainly, Lola's past endeavours in Formula 1 lacked the luster of Lotus and its contemporaries, but warranted more than just a few cursory threads on F1's rich tapestry. And when the opportunity came up in 2009 for teams to join the F1 grid the following year with the promise of a £40 million budget cap, Lola saw an opportunity to reignite its efforts at the top level of motorsport. Unlike many of the startup entities, Lola already had the infrastructure in place needed to build a Formula 1 team. From its years of developing chassis and products for the motorsport industry, Lola had a fully functioning composites workshop and wind tunnel, along with all the other kits needed to make a go of racing. The birth of Lola's 2010 F1 project was entwined with both the extinct Super Aguri team and Ireland's A1 GP project, another category which used Lola machinery before its ill-fated switch to the expensive Ferrari design cars. The Irish team, led by Mark Gallagher, had won the 2008-2009 edition of the A1 GP series, its final season, with Ulsterman Adam Carroll behind the wheel. Gallagher had known Boring for years and was the first point of call to get the F1 entry off the ground. The two had previously worked together in the 1990s, when Gallagher was helping the Pacific team to help keep its head above water, and had done a deal with Bahrain to put money into Keith Wiggins' struggling team. Since then, discussions over F1 had always been on the cards, but Gallagher says that Bahrain didn't have a commercial reason to throw his hat into the ring. Bahrain was happy to put his money where his mouth was for the first couple of years to get the ball rolling, bringing in Gallagher as commercial director. Engineer Jerry Hughes, who had worked with Gallagher at Ireland's A1 GP team, came on board too as technical director, having become part of the former Super Aguri contingent along with team manager Daniele Ordetto and designer Peter McCall. Although Lola already had plenty of personnel on board, Hughes and McCall set about recruiting extra heads with F1 experience to bring the project forward. They'd also set to work on planning new facilities available at the Lola headquarters in Huntingdon. The design departments would be set up on the top floor and the race bays and subassembly workshops were drawn up for the bottom floor. With the wind tunnel facilities also available, Lola had even gone as far as designing and testing a model of its new car, the MB01. Technically, Lola had everything it needed to produce a Formula 1 car, and even had a deal on the table for the Cosworth engines that the FAA was keen for the new teams to use. Within the initial £40 million cost cap, the Cosworths were the affordable option too, and even had courted F1 stalwarts Williams after its Toyota deal came to an end post-2009. Hughes explains that Lola planned to use a classic F1 startup team approach, with a mix of permanent employees, lean on Lola cars and Lola composites to provide their own insight, along with contractors. The McCall-led design was also going to be conventional to ensure Lola didn't design itself into a corner from which it couldn't develop its way out of. Although Bahrain was happy to put his own money into the team, part of the FIA's entry criteria was to demonstrate that the team could be self-sufficient. Gallagher, a veteran of pulling together sponsorship deals with Jordan, knew that the most surefire route to securing a budget was to ask the drivers to bring one. 
Even after the £40 million cost cap fell by the wayside, Lola predicted that it could operate on about £50 million, and Gallagher suggested that around 10 to 20% of that could come from the drivers. Gallagher explained that it was a prudent approach, and in his time at Jordan had asked multiple drivers to bring in funding, even Rubens Barrichello, who had backing from multiple Brazilian companies ahead of his debut in 1993. Word around the paddock was that Carroll, having enjoyed success with Gallagher and Hughes in A1GP, was to be one of the drivers and would make his F1 debut after two and a bit years in GP2. Depending on who you ask, Takuma Sato was set to be the other, although the rumour has since been denied by his own camp. Adam Carroll himself suggests that two were in line to form Lola's 2010 lineup. After all, XBAR and Super Aguri driver Sato was on the F1 sidelines after failing to upstage Sebastian Bourdais for a Toro Rosso seat, and his experience would have made for a good fit for one of the prospective entrants. Gallagher stresses that getting two pay drivers to form the lineup could have counted against Carroll, who barely had any backing, and suggests that reuniting with his former drivers might have been a more romantic notion. Talking to those at Lola, there still seems to be some surprise a decade later that the team never managed to make the grid, especially compared to those who did. So where did it all go awry? To that end, there are different theories. One of those theories begins with the entry processes. A tribunal of former Jaguar chief Tony Purnell and a number of people from Deloitte were in charge of checking the team's financial plans. Lola was questioned on its pay driver plans, which Gallagher feels partially counted against the team. Eventual teams relied on pay drivers too, but were perhaps less transparent about it. The financiers looking at the entry plans perhaps naively thought that the teams would come in with full funding, which Gallagher labelled since as pie-in-the-sky thinking. Furthermore, having worked with FIA President Max Mosley and F1 Supremo Bernie Ecclestone before, Martin Bahrain knew the two well. Bahrain was a huge fan of the budget cap proposal and was less enamoured with the FIA's eventual decision to drop it, also dropping the performance advantage that the new teams would receive and recompense. This left Bahrain upset, who wanted to have a chance of running competitively on the F1 grid with shared parts from other teams and the originally touted performance benefits. It's possible that Bahrain might have voiced some concerns to Bernie Ecclestone during the tender process, particularly as the cost caps began to increase, and Ecclestone convinced him that it might not be a good idea long term for Lola to race in a series without the initial budget cap. Whatever the true reason for Lola's failed F1 entry, those involved feel that the team could have made a proper go of it and transcended the other new entries on the grid. With its existing infrastructure, Lola had all of the ingredients in place to do so. But although Lola ceased car production in 2012, its name is now up for sale along with its technology centre and wind tunnel, so the Lola name could very soon return to the world of motorsport. Martin Bahrain sadly passed away at the age of 82 in 2018, having never managed to realise his F1 dream. It was a travesty that Lola never managed to get the green light from the FIA, but the next team that we'll look at did, but failed to make it for a whole host of reasons.